we have the Good Friday services today. So let's begin. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many as were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not been heard, not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter or the sheep before the shares, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sins of the, his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and he will, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And you will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. For all my foes, I am an object of reproach, a laughingstock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemy and my persecutors. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. 
So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lantern, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he asked, again, asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those who gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and the other disciple followed Jesus. Now, the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the mate, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this, this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in a temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to him to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? 
Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release a prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and handed him, had him scourged, and his soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus said, did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you as the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover. It was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, carrying the cross himself. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross it read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be in order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, but for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. 
When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other, one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified and his testimony is true. He knows that, that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another best passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close at hand. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. Hi. What can one say after a gospel like this? It must be love, love that covers a multitude of sins, love that looks out for the good of the other, disregarding one's own comfort and likes. The cross is what Jesus came for, the hour he said he would come for. And the hour came, the strange and yet wonderful thing about Jesus and his passion from the moment of his conception, he knew what he would go through all his life. All, every year, he thought about what would happen to him. There was not one moment in his life where he had no vision of the hour for which he was to come and be bo was born. The hour that kept him going. And he was not looking forward to it because he even prayed Father, let this cup pass me by, but not my will, but yours be done. Christ, even Christ, shirked the way from suffering because it was so horrendous and so immense and infinite suffering, if we could say. Because he's an infinite God, he was able to bear an infinite suffering. Because as God, he could not suffer, he took on a human nature. He took a nature unto himself that in this human nature he was able to suffer and die. So can we say that God died? No, we can't say that. God does not die, but Jesus Christ in his human nature did die for our sins. So that leaves us now who are called Christians. We are, we are born for an hour the hour when we stand before the judgment seat of God. So if we recognize that we are born for God and for his glory, and Christ is our shepherd and our leader, 
Ought we not to imitate Christ in all things? We preach the good news. We love people. We care for them. We, can, we do what we can do for them. Yet knowing that in turn we will be turned in, so to speak, will be attacked by the very same people whom we came to serve. But it doesn't, that shouldn't stop us from serving God. Because serving God is a gift. A gift that ha those have who keep their ears and eyes fixed upon the Lord. That's why we have a crucifix. As Catholics, we have crucifixes reminding us of what Christ has done. When you are sick at home in bed and you look at the crucifix and say, my suffering is really nothing compared to your suffering. When you're really down and out and think the world has to end now because your pain is so much, keep on looking up to the crucifix with Christ on the cross. He suffered so much that he gives an example on how to accept everything. Everything can be born in this world if we're doing it out of love. If it's a selfish reason, then we cannot come to any success. But if we do suffer in union with Christ and unite our suffering with that of Jesus, all of a sudden everything we do becomes very fruitful. And that really is participating in love. Love. If love is not shown to someone, that person will never find love. But love has been shown to us. It has been shown to us in the person of Christ. St. Paul talks about him splendidly, how he took our suffering. For our sins, we are crucified. And even Isaiah in the Old Testament foreshadowed, there he stood silent, like a lamb before its share is not open in his mouth. Just think about you and I, what we do when we're being slandered and accused and being uh, radically opposed. Do we stand silent before those accusers because we know that there is a Redeemer and Christ the Redeemer will save us. Life is good. And for those who participate in the suffering, not that suffering is an end, it's just a way of life so that we show God how much we love and care for Him and then we are being able to enter into the glory and resurrection of Christ. Good Friday is not the end. It is the resurrection on Sunday. It is when Christ comes back to life, foretold in the scriptures, broadcast by the angels. Yes, Christ will come to life. And for those who believe, those who have lived a life with Christ will also come to his resurrection. But we cannot but enter into this mystery, the mystery of the cross. It is the custom on Good Friday that we pray for the world. So here are the general intercessions. We pray for the church. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty and ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout the whole world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the Pope. Let us also pray for our Most Holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for all orders and degrees of the faithful. We also pray for our bishop, Bishop Donald Hain, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayers for your ministers, 
that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the catechumens. Let us also pray for our catechumens that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in a font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the unity of Christians. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our Lord and God may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the Jewish people. Let us also pray for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who bestowed your promise on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church. That the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for those who do not believe in Christ. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for those who do not believe in God. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right in sincerity of heart, that they may find the way to God himself. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for those in public office. Let us pray for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of the people, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the unborn that the right to life may be recognized and protected. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you alone are the author and Lord of life. Protect our unborn brothers and sisters from the danger of abortion and give us the grace to work tirelessly that their right to life may always and everywhere be secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the afflicted in time of pandemic. Let's also pray for all those who suffer the consequences of current pandemic, 
that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families, and salvation to all the victims who have died. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, only support of the human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick, give strength to those who care for them, welcome into your peace those who have died, and throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for those in tribulation. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loose and fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick and salvation to the dying. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the final blessing. May your abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bless you, mighty God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come upon and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.